And hi, we are live. Um, I'm Bob Boros. This is my jazz and tap dance life. This is my YouTube jazz dance channel where we talk about all things related to jazz and tap dance. Uh, many videos we have there on uh, technique, history, um, opinion, uh, perspectives on jazz dance. But one big thing I'm doing now is an interview series with many people who are important in jazz dance research and choreography and performance. And so right now we have a very special uh, uh, sequence today coming up. We have Dr. Kim Chandler Vaccaro, who's from Ryder University. And she is a well-known source about a very obscure, but very important uh, jazz dance historian. Um, her name is Maura Den. So we're gonna bring uh, Dr. Chandler, I'm sorry, Dr. Vaccaro into here and uh, we'll get started and find out why is this person so important in jazz dance and why have we not heard of her? So here she is. Okay, hello, Kim, how are you? Hi, Bob, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you're welcome, you're welcome. I'm glad you can be here because this is such, I, I mean, when I say obscure, I don't mean in a bad way, but it's something that nobody knows about this person and yet she was so right on the money and so important and she was doing these things in the 1930s and 40s before anybody was even doing these things. So we're gonna get to talk about more then in just a, a moment. But um, really quickly, can you just talk about like, you know, what, do you, what are you doing in jazz dance? You know, where's your position? You know, what do you teach? Where are you situated in jazz dance right now? Well, let's see. Um, I have, I spent the better part of my, last 20 years investigating the form. I was introduced, I had studied with a vaudeville hoofer as a child, mm -hmm. um, tap and jazz, and she was really into rhythm. So she really instilled that in me. I studied in California. And when I was at UCLA, I met Lorraine Person Crige. Mm -hmm. And then Lorraine and I became great friends. She was my mentor for a few years. She was teaching in the recreation department very unique person, choreographer and dancer from the Parody Latin mm -hmm. um, Paris. She was engaged to once and toured with Harry James in his orchestra. And she wrote about um, the incredible relationship between jazz dance and jazz music. So she was quite an influence on me. When she left UCLA and came back to New York, I took her place um, teaching. And then when I moved back here, she asked if I wanted to write a book on jazz dance. She was Luigi's biographer. Mm -hmm. And I went into the city and took classes with Luigi as often as possible, of course. And then she asked me if I wanted to write a book on jazz dance. And it was called Jazz Dance Today. It mm -hmm. was textbook series for community colleges. Mm -hmm. I have that book. I have and, it. And Luigi actually wrote the foreword mm -hmm. of that book. Right. So my background was in really Luigi's style of dancing. It was much more for entertainment, choreography, Broadway, etc. But when I went to get my doctorate, I went to Temple University. And of course, mm -hmm. they had the first African-American studies program. So I was, I was doing research for my dissertation. Um, I was being mentored by some of the greatest black dance scholars in our time. Mm -hmm. Brenda Dixon Gottschild, for instance, mm -hmm. and Yamu Asante. Mm -hmm. And so when I found Maura Den as part of that research, I was under a very, very watchful eye. Um, <laughs> concerning everything in how I contexted, how I looked at the language that I used in response to what they thought was, why is this white woman doing this dissertation mm -hmm. on African-American dance? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I was really proud of the fact that Brenda signed off on my dissertation and it got the seal of approval. And But from that moment, then my journey has been really dance as a cultural perspective and mm -hmm. how it's embedded um, in culture and really influenced by everything in the culture. Mm -hmm. So that escapade into studying Maura Den was really amazing because she was a dancer and a performer, but she was really an anthropologist. And so looking at her work really contexted mm -hmm. inside the culture was really um, 
uh, point of departure for me in the rest of the work that I did at university. So then all of the courses I designed were really looking about looking mm -hmm. at arts in culture. Mm -hmm. And I've maintained that position actually through all the years. Okay. All right. Now uh, we're going to talk about uh, Mora in just a second, but just for anyone who's watching now, please put in a comment, check in, um, just say hi, say where you're from. And if you have a question, for Kim, you can always put that in there. And at some point um, during the interview, we'll try to get to your questions too, okay? So, Maura Den, who is she? Where is she from? What time period was she working? Who is this person? She's really fascinating. She was born in Odessa, Russia. She was a Jewish woman and her family actually had to flee during the workers' revolution because her father was an engineer. Um, mm -hmm and an intellectual. So they f went first to London and then she ended up in Vienna. She studied Delsart, Duncan Dance, Dal Crows, gymnastics, Commedia del Arte. And when they were in London, she went to Vienna and started uh, studying ballet. She became an incredible dancer and was really heralded throughout mm. Europe for many years. She oh. did solo dance tours. She was on the cover of many magazines. At one point, she was voted the shapeliest woman in all of Europe. Mm -hmm. which was wow. interesting. But it was on one of those tours, she was in Paris, um, that she saw Josephine Baker. And that, because of all her training and all these things, um, really sent her on this obsession with jazz dance. She immediately mm -hmm. began choreographing and using the work of Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. And then um, after she married, traveling back and forth to the United States, particularly to New York, uh, to experience the city. And she knew she needed to be there to uh, be part of the jazz dance experience. When she came wow. in, so she continued to perform for many years. So she heard about, she was discovered jazz dance while she was in Europe. Yeah, exactly. True? Yes, and she was already choreographing to um, great jazz music when she was there and made it a part of what mm -hmm. she did. Mm -hmm. But at some point she says, I have to come to New York or to the United States and experience the real thing. Exactly. She felt so connected with jazz dance. She really uh -huh. felt already that was her home. And then unfortunately, her family fled Paris be when um, the German invasion was happening and her father came over and mm -hmm. um, they actually had to get out again. She had to <laughs> leave mm -hmm. two homes, but she really felt okay. New York was um, her home. Right. So she arrives in, in New York City, and if you know sort of an approximate year, you can let us know that too. But then, like, what did she do? What did she get involved with at that point in time? She immediately sought out jazz dance, and she actually went to the Savoy Ballroom two or three times a week. Um, she was okay. um, she was back and forth in the late 20s, early 30s, and but she was absolutely here by 1932. I remember because she became a, a US citizen. Her husband, Alfred Den, was a, a lithographer and artist, and he was from the United States. And so she mm -hmm. was able to get citizenship in 1932. She continued to go back and forth uh, for some years, but she was also performing here in the States during that time, in New York, in Boston, um, many places. And at the same mm -hmm. time, investigating everything that had to do with jazz dance and meeting people and taking lessons and really uh, um, immersing herself in the culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so as she's here, she's going to the Savoy Ballroom, she's, she's friending different, a uh, jazz dancer, she's getting immersed in that whole culture of it. But at the same time, she started to really analyze and to write about this culture at a time and from a direction um, that no one was really doing at that time. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, 
And I have to tell you that she was, she's such an amazing woman. She spoke five languages, which actually published in three. But mm -hmm. her feeling was she wanted to document every single thing she saw because she felt she, we were witnessing the birth of a truly American art form, of something that we had never seen before that couldn't have happened any other mm -hmm. place except for here. And she um, knew that modern dance was being studied in universities and ballet had this long history of studied in academia. And she felt that jazz dance really should have that same kind of recognition. So she just started writing down and describing everything that she saw. As mm -hmm. early as 1936, she presented a incredible plea at the first dance Congress. It was the first National Dance Congress. I believe it was mm -hmm. held at the 92nd Street Y. There were other mm -hmm. luminaries there, but her point was, um, this is incredible. This is an ethnic minority in the United States, and they've totally transformed the way that we look at the dancing body, that it is completely different than European folk forms. It's completely different mm -hmm. than African forms. It is incredibly new and it opened up a whole new way of moving for everyone. And it became a world sensation. She was just fascinated by the fact that this ethnic minority, African Americans in the United States could create something. They were the major players in creating something that went global and was a craze all over the world. She was so mm -hmm. enamored by it and kept pleading mm -hmm. with people. So she just started writing and she didn't get into filming until a couple decades later, probably didn't have the access to the equipment, um, mm -hmm. but she uh, wrote down stories. She tried to record in any way she could kept programs um, of what she was seeing. Mm -hmm. Now, so she's writing, she's writing articles. I know some of the things were published eventually in um, the fledgling dance magazine of that time, but she was writing from a, a much different perspective and appreciation for the jazz dance art that was normally seen from the traditional dance critic establishment. Um, in, in the United States and in the, in the New York publications. So what, how was she seeing it and how was she writing about this jazz dance form that was so different from the way it was sort of being seen from other directions? It was pretty much um, thought of as substandard to most of um, the dance critics of the time that they mm -hmm. couldn't appreciate the skill and the creativity because it wasn't formalized into some kind of technique, um, which was mm -hmm. the, the other concert dance forms. And so what she did is um, she was friends with some of the greatest uh, black artists of the times like Zora Neale Hurston. And Zora Neale mentored her in anthropological methods of collecting data and contexting that, um, contesting what she was seeing inside of the full experience. Um, as I said, though, she wrote in, she spoke and wrote in five languages. And so mm -hmm. very uh, descriptive and metaphorical, sometimes poetic way of writing that was not as academic as an other anthropologists of the day, but she, she certainly was using the methods. She traveled um, to the South. She went to juke joints and honky tonks and um, churches and gatherings and festivals. 
And because she was friends with these noted African-Americans like Langston Hughes, who introduced her to people, mm -hmm. reverends in the South, she actually had access. She could get into, as a white woman, into a black church and witness what was happening in music and dance. And then able to wow. attribute this uh, new movement style as um, part social comment and political statement that was expressed through the body. And that's what she thought mm -hmm. jazz dance really was, mm -hmm. that it was a reaction to everything. In New York City, it was reaction to the movement of the city and the streets of the city. And at first it was about freedom and then it was about maybe not being so free, but everything that she saw, she felt was represented in this dancing body. And to her, she really thought that conception of the body, that things can move in all different directions and be totally inspired by the rhythm of the movement was completely different than anything she had experienced before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she's providing a, an analysis as a, a passive viewer um, in some way and writing these things down from a very uh, integral standpoint and not from, um, you know, uh, something that's a hyped up sort of standpoint. This is what we would see in, in many of the other writings of, of that time. So now when she's writing, where did her writings appear? Where, where would people have seen what she was writing? I think over time she published um, 12 or 16 articles um, in dance magazine, dance journals, um, mm -hmm. some jazz music places. So it was being seen in some places, but a large, ex and later on she wrote poetry that was published, she wrote books, but a large part of her writing wasn't published. In fact, mm -hmm. when I went to review her writing at the New York Public Library at that time, there was something like 42 boxes of folders and writings could be just shoved into folders just on pieces of paper and napkins and programs. She mm -hmm. was prolific wow. all the time. There was something like a total of 2,500 pieces in there. Um, to wow. go over. There was a 271 page manuscript that was never um, published, but was sort of meant to be a, not so much a script, but a description of her movie, The Spirit Moves. Mm -hmm. um, we had 16 films. The Spirit Moves itself was in seven two part sections. There, so, but almost all of it when she died, in 1987, I found her work in 1994-ish, something like that. And it, she was very, very obscure. Not many people remembered what she wrote in the 40s mm -hmm. in Dance Magazine or at the Dance Congress at all. Mm -hmm. And from the 50s on, she was really dedicating herself a lot to making films. She thought a film was a much better book of movement much better than what you could describe in words. Right, right. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to watch some video of the Spirit Moves, which is her her compilation, in just a minute. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, her writing from here. Now, I have, which actually came from my Gus Giordano anthology of American Jazz Dance, of which there's a big compendium of different um, articles and writers. But this is something she wrote, More Respect for the Clown, in March 19. 46 has published in Dance Magazine and just some of the ways that she's writing. And it, there's a, a statement in here that I just wanted to ask you about, um, which is interesting to me. And she writes, one of the very important and striking differences between jazz and African dancing is the absence of syncopation in African dancing. Syncopation is essential to jazz and was unknown to us until the Negro people introduced it in jazz music and dancing. Um, now, I mean, I have read different ideas on that and, and always saying that, you know, the root of our dancing comes from the African tradition and jazz dancing certainly is based in syncopation. She's claiming that 
African dance does not have syncopation. So is that uh, is that a valid statement on her part? Because um, I am not somebody who is who is knowledgeable in African music and dance. Right. You know, my take on that is probably it's a bit of an editorial glip. And that she might have mm -hmm. been talking about one particular African dance and not the whole of African dance, because certainly we all okay. know that syncopation is part of the spectrum, right? But there are mm -hmm. certain dances like the ring shout where the feet are on the floor, they're moving in 4-4 four, four time, and it's the body responding on top as they move around that's really um, part of that experience. And she might have been introduced to one of those dances in the South, and she said African dance, and there was nobody there to correct her or do the editorial glip. Mm -hmm. Certainly, she talked extensively about rhythm as being the most potent aspect of jazz mm -hmm. dance. In fact, um, she said her and James Berry were having a conversation and she, that he told her the body becomes percussive, that there's this inherent rhythm inside that is expressed in jazz dance. But she also thought that... Um, the African dance that was brought here was immediately being transformed and transfigured by the association with the European colonizers um, that the enslaved people came in contact with. And so the idea of syncopation as in a Lindy where there's that quick Da -da, like a ball change mm -hmm. that brings that movement forward that we're used to, she felt was an African-American invention, not an African mm -hmm. invention. So I don't think she was looking at all of African dance. I think that might have been just a little um, glue because she was really uh, connected to the understanding of rhythm inside jazz dance. And certainly... Mm -hmm. One of the other things that she knew and other people talked about, Roger and Duke Ellington, is that um, African dance was much more complicated um, and polyrhythmic than African-American dance. African-American dance is more polymetric with the same rhythm. Mm -hmm. Multiple meters can happen inside of that. Whereas African dance is really polyrhythmic. There can be a seven, eight on a three, four on a two. Th you know, so there's many different things happening. It's much more complicated. And then when it, mm -hmm. when she called it the Negro brought that here in the very first interchanges, those rhythms were being modified and transformed because of the influence of the European dances. They'd watch their European masters dance. They would take that into their own body and then mm -hmm. completely transform it with different rhythmic impulses. Mm -hmm. But it was always mm -hmm. that blending of the two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And another thing she talked about, which is in the in the same article, um, she talked about um, relaxation in the joints and also, you know, the very relaxed body and also a reflexive action in terms of movement. And as I mentioned to you once in a, in a different conversation, my studies with Matt Maddox, one of the, uh, you know, the legends in jazz dance, he, that's exactly what he talked about all the time. Relaxation in movement and having a reflex action where it's not a thought out process, it's something that happens in the moment and that's the most economical and efficient type of a movement that you can do. So uh, maybe you can mention a little bit um, of her ideas on relaxation and reflex. Yeah, that's exactly true. She, she had this idea that in ballet, you started with a rigid form and there were prescribed gates that you had, the body had to go through. And each mm -hmm. one had a sense of pose and each one had a sense of um, sort of rigidity and tension mm -hmm. involved in it. And rather than going through these gates or places of tension, she felt in jazz dance that the body was completely relaxed. And when the spirit moves you, then the impulse 
happened. And it couldn't happen if you were already tense. It had to come out of a relaxed place. You had to be mm -hmm. ready to receive that. The body was open to the re rhythmic response right away. Mm -hmm. And that that's what jazz was, this incredible interplay of, mm -hmm. of moving and relaxing. And in that way, she felt it was an incredibly authentic, um, especially during the golden mm -hmm. age before the codification mm -hmm. of all of the steps um, that um, and forms that we know now. She thought it was just this incredible, authentic way of movement, totally inspired by the rhythmic impulse. And like you said, mm -hmm. um, it was this blending of uh, being open to that experience in that mm -hmm. moment. And the moment involved the music and also mm -hmm. feeling the spirit when, mm -hmm. when you were moved by the spirit, that's when it happened. And when the spirit left, mm -hmm. when that rhythm left, then the body right. was still. Yeah. So that, that would make, make the movement almost like infinitely uh, more complex and in terms of individuality in terms of what the possibilities are when you compare it to as you said something from more western form where there are standard positions that you will will move through each individual person does whatever is in them at the moment and it that just makes it very again very hard to study very hard to write down very hard to document just from that very nature i would think yeah, absolutely. And that's why she said the vocabulary and the steps are very problematic to write down because each repetition is different. Each repetition mm -hmm. will have its own impulse and it's changing mm -hmm. all the time. And the individual is free to change it mm -hmm. all the time and to use it. Right. So it did now, because of that, there's not a standard idea that maybe many people would follow. Did she feel that there was a technique in terms of like a teaching method that people can follow to learn this, or is it really just an individual thing where you find your own way into this jazz dance puzzle? What's really interesting is um, she felt at the beginning of a jazz class that she was teaching, the warm up had to be really investigating the inside of the body, really coming in contact with what was going on and mm -hmm. feeling your center and your spine. And once you were in that place, you could begin to move. Mm -hmm. she, she wrote down what she thought were uh, steps and vocabulary that everybody should know. But then those steps were practiced in um, a very oral way, a very subjective way. So if you think mm -hmm. of ballet as being very visual, the shapes are very clear, right? And classified and codified. And so there's an mm -hmm. objectivity to how we teach it. And there, um, because of that, right, those gates that we have to go through. Her idea was much more internal and subjective and oral. So it was mm -hmm. much more about the rhythm, about feeling, about hearing, and getting that movement in your body before you moved. So she always thought it was very problematic to teach steps because what do they actually look like? So different, you know, mm -hmm. um, according to who's doing them, at what time, to what music. Mm -hmm. But she was trying to find a way to teach this because she had what was called the Academy of Swing, which was a school in New York City. And I guess it's right around that same 1946-ish time period. But here is somebody who had a school to learn jazz dancing a decade before the beginnings of what we call jazz dance techniques came out in the mid and later 1950s. Um, so what was she doing? What was the Academy of Swing and what was taught there? Uh, it was great. She opened it with Asadata Defora. So he was teaching African mm -hmm. dance. Okay. She was teaching both theoretical um, classes and dance classes. And Al Legans, who was the dancer in a jazz way, it's labeled wrong on one of... Um, 
on something I saw recently. It's not Al Min's in her kitchen, it's Al Legan's. And he was one of the most famous Dan, uh, teachers at the Savoy Ballroom. He was actually the one teaching jazz dance steps most of the time. Her mm -hmm. courses, um, and there's actually, I, I had, there was a folder with an outline in it. And it had things like the alphabet of jazz. And so there were, um, as many lecture courses as there were dance classes, which is interesting. She talked about trends of jazz, choreography of jazz, mm -hmm. European and the African body in jazz. Um, mm -hmm. Then there were sections on pre-classic, which she called 1900 to 1918, on Charleston, on Lindy, on Jitterbug. She did um, lectures on people and institutions, and most importantly, the social functions of jazz and the therapeutic value of jazz and race relations in jazz. So she was covering this mm -hmm. huge scope of information in relationship to the topic. And while she was there, she taught some studio classes and Al Legans was teaching uh, the mm -hmm. other classes. Mm -hmm. But there isn't any written information like a, a, a syllabus or an outline for an actual class. Like we only know the topics, but we don't know the meat of what the class was like. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, okay. There are notes in her collection. There's notes in several folders. There's an outline. Um, she also did lectures at the New School of Social Research. Uh, she did quite a few talks all over the city, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's pretty exciting is that since I did my dissertation in 97, the New York Public Library has um, digitized and categorized all of her information. So, for instance, mm -hmm. when I was okay. in, they'd just bring out a box, and then I would be going through all the folders, and there was no categorization or organization whatsoever. Mm -hmm finding things arbitrarily. But in 2017, they actually went through all the boxes and categorized it. So even if you go to the online catalog now, if you go into something called scholarly writings, you can see lists of some of the dances and um, steps that she did inside of those classes. But there's no real recording like a syllabus or uh, anything like that. Anything that we would think of as university material mm -hmm. or um, mm -hmm. that I remember finding in there at all. It was mm -hmm. pretty much me putting together the pieces of all of this um, in 97. Right. Um, I was finding right. pieces all over the place and putting them yeah. together. Mm -hmm. you so so we have um, in the later in the, into the 1950s, uh, you know, mathematics was bringing out a, a technique. Luigi had a technique. There were other people who were developing things. So there is this thought process of here are exercises to do to learn how to be a quote jazz dancer. Um, and from what you're describing, even in within her Academy of Swing, there were lots of contextual things that she was maybe bringing out maybe a short course in, in sort of steps that maybe people did in ballrooms. But do you think she felt, was there such a thing as a jazz dance technique where you could actually learn movements and learn something to make you a dancer? Or was it still something where you just understood the whole contextual thing of what it is and you, you still find your way through it and develop your own, your own ability? Well, what she called the golden age of jazz was the 20s to the 40s. And she felt that those mm -hmm. steps could be taught at the Savoy Ballroom and by other people and certainly in her um, school. From then on, she never really felt that you could put a cap on jazz like that, that it was mm -hmm. always constantly changing, that bebop was so different from the Lindy that had become before. That rock and roll went into a totally other place. And when break mm -hmm. came out, that was a totally different thing. So she never said there was one of anything. 
Um, mm -hmm. When people started codifying, Bob, would you agree that they were doing it because people in, were getting jobs on Broadway and in entertainment? Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, then they would go learn from people. And so those teachers mm -hmm. codify the material and organize it that way. So these people mm -hmm. were prepared to go to auditions mm -hmm. and participate in those shows. But she, um, that wasn't the area that she went into at all. Instead, like you said, she was contextualizing and she then went into promoting. She started promoting the Savoy dancers and directing them in 1945. They started doing concerts around the city. And of course that mm -hmm. was still the authentic traditional jazz dance of the golden age from the 20s to the 40s. And so she, um, there were no classes in that still. Mm -hmm. She was pulling them out of the Savoy, the best dancers, I and the, the impresario, presenting them in mm -hmm. concert and directing, documenting those experiences. And that went okay. on actually for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's one quick question for you. Um, how do you spell, you mentioned Al Legans. How is that spelled? Do you know? Uh, that's so funny. I can remember, um, I saw at least four spellings of his name. The one <laughs> I now use is L-I-E-G-E-N-S, Legans, but mm -hmm. I've seen it spelled that way. I've also seen it, seen it spelled with an A. And uh, yeah, there's a bunch of variations, but the one that she oh, most used was L I E G E N. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now let's get into the the really big thing of her work. And she created a um, film series called The Spirit Moves, and it documented these dancers, as you said, from the golden age, um, dancing the way they would dance. And it's just a remarkable, remarkable capsule of this is what it was um, at that time period. So you've given me um, a video clip, we're gonna pull that up. So maybe you can talk a little bit over this and just talk a little bit about what the Spirit Moves is and and who are these people and, and what are the dances that they're doing? And let me just do a couple of clicks here and I will get this going. Uh, so this is great. You can't uh, really see from the faces, but these would have been the greatest dancers of the Savoy. She not only had relationships with them professionally, she was actually recreationally, she danced with them and she also had emotional she, uh, friendships with all of these mm -hmm. people. What she asked them uh, to do here often was to improvise. And unfortunately, the technology didn't exist that she could have the music, the actual music. So music was overlaid. But what she wanted mm -hmm. to know that was that once steps were created, such as the Charleston, which uh, you saw quite a bit at the beginning of this, that they were never lost, that they were always transformed into something else. Um, so you could witness the early steps becoming another step and yet another step as you went on. This is actually footage from the Savoy Ballroom. And that's mm -hmm. a fascinating story because uh, she had to fight with Charles Buchanan, who was the manager there, to even let her come in. Oh, this is a different one from um, a Lindy Hop, an aerial contest, actually. I believe that that's actually at the Palladium in New York City. But yeah, this is what was going on in a social manner at the Savoy. And it was so athletic and incredible. Look at this man right here. You can't really tell. I believe it's Al mm -hmm. dancing, but the athleticism and the creativity and the ingenuity and the improvisation, the individuality was just exceptional. Mm -hmm. There was this other thing that she always claimed too, that the European influence was always there in a kind of elegance 
in the body, the um, held position of the torso and um, so it was this incredible blend. These are so fun to watch. Mm -hmm. every, yes, absolutely. Yeah, every uh, thing that they could think of was brought back and it was an incredible response to the music. And you can see the expression of what they're doing, the total embodiment of what they're doing all the time in here. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the whole series, um, the series itself? How long is it and like, what does it cover? You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, she was so fascinating. She gave her entire collection, every single thing that she owned to Aiko and Como, who were a very famous modern dance mm -hmm. avant-garde um, couple. She had met them at the Roseland um, Ballroom um, and were great friends for the last decade and a half of her life. And she had created a Spirit Moves Parts of it were shown at festivals actually um, in Europe and had some recognition, but it had never been published and she had never really made any money off it. So she gave the whole thing to Aiko and Como and said, here, publish it and put your kids through college. And uh, mm -hmm. so in her incredible generosity, just turned around and gave it to the New York Public Library. So I believe altogether oh, okay. there were 16 films um, mm -hmm. There were 14 two-part sections that ranged from the 19, uh, she didn't begin filming until about the 50s, and went up through breakdancing towards the end of her life in the early 80s. And mm -hmm. what has been assembled is about two hours, I believe, of that whole collection. Wow. Yeah, the wow. rest of it is still in the library. There's much, much more to see, actually. But it is an amazing contribution. She was the only person mm -hmm. ever let into the Savoy Ballroom to do that, except for an occasional newsreel. And she had to badger them forever to get permission to do it. She had to mm -hmm. set up in one corner and not move anything. She couldn't disrupt patrons. And she kept going, but this is important. This is history of mm -hmm. America. Uh, you have to let me do this. And finally, he said, okay, if you don't annoy anybody, go ahead and do it. But then as okay. she um, realized that she really needed more footage, she brought some of those dancers into a studio. You can see that that was a studio setting. And mm -hmm. then asked them to do the same dances they would have in the Savoy inside that setting. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Here's an important question. I mean, is this available? I know it's on YouTube, but is this is this something that a person could just buy it and have the DVDs for their own personal I use? I believe it's available now for purchase. A small section of it. It's really mm -hmm. um, it's it it's something that you've hardly ever seen before. It's really mm -hmm. amazing. Okay. I was thrilled. I don't know if Aiko released it or who was able to actually get it out, but it's a gem. Mm -hmm. Everybody should have it in their collection. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's amazing too when you look at it, you look what the dancer is doing and you definitely see the through line all the way up to what people are doing today in terms of movement. There is definitely a connection to how the body is reacting to rhythm and, and what it's capable of, of, of doing. So, you know, it's all part of a big continuum. Absolutely. And that's what she's mm -hmm. thought all the way up to break dancing. In the latter part mm -hmm. of her life, she even found kids on the streets and brought them into the studio mm -hmm. and said, I need to wow. do this. I need to document mm -hmm. this as this lineage of what happened in mm -hmm. African American dance. Okay. Okay. I'm I have a couple of uh, photos here that we're gonna pull up images of some of the dancers who you would have seen in that last spirit moves, and maybe you could just identify these dancers and, and say a little bit about them. And I had put this up just before. Oh, is this the Berry Brothers? This is the Berry Brothers. Yeah, you know, I forget one of them's name. There was James, that was one of her best friends, Nias, and shoot, I'm sorry, I don't remember the third names, but you know what, they were a class act, the way that the Nicholas Brothers or Fred Astaire was a class act. They performed in mm -hmm. top hats, uh, in tuxedos, in canes. They were 
unbelievably athletic and elegant. And mm -hmm. um, they did, we don't know as much about them because they didn't make the movies with Gene Kelly like the Nicholas Brothers did. We have that documentary mm -hmm. now so we can keep going back to it. But in a contest once they were against the Nicholas Brothers and actually they were chosen as the better dancers. The, wow. They, yeah, can you imagine? Wow. Um, and James Berry was one of her best friends, actually, in the last part of his life after he was evicted. He lived with Muradin in her apartment in Washington Heights. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go on, go on to the next one. Um, hold on while I do a couple of clicks here. And this is... Oh, Pepsi. <laughs> yes. I interviewed Pepsi um, when I was doing my work on Mora, and he was incredibly indebted to mm -hmm. the promotion that she did of African American artists. He definitely was one of the people that danced with her quite a bit, and um, did concerts all throughout New York, toured in the traditional jazz dance company, and he mm -hmm. really for a lot of credit for trying to um, uplift the form and make it um, people see its value and validate it in the ways that she was doing. He also talked quite a bit about rhythm and uh, the use of rhythm in what they um, what they did. But you can also see he was a class act too. When he traveled mm -hmm. with Laura, he also was a very athletic, um, lots of tricks, jazz dancer. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. he could do it all. He, as many of them did, they were also exquisite tap dancers and did both tap wow. and jazz. And mm -hmm. uh, Maura didn't write and document tap the way she did folk dance because um, she called jazz the folk dance of the people, the dance of the masses that everyone could do. It was a social dance. It was this incredible, unique form. But she said there were only a few in the back rooms. They were using the same music. They had a lot of the same rhythm, but there was only a few doing the tap dance and they were doing these competitions and it was for a distinct group of people. So she didn't concentrate in that area. But when she went on tour, Al Mins, Leon James, Pepsi Bethel, they were all tap and jazz together. They did it all. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's pull up another dancer. Uh, here we go. This is. Ah. Norma Miller. This right. is Norma Miller. Who is Norma Miller? You know, she was one of the most amazing swing dancers. She was a Savoy dancer. She was in um, a lot of the movies um, that were made. And she was also um, a noted dancer with Frankie Manning. But she was not mm -hmm. somebody that Maura spent a lot of time with, actually. Um, I think there was kind of a rift there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But she's not mentioned in much of Maura's work. However, she was with all of the same people at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an enigma we probably won't figure out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one final answer. Um, this is Willa Mae Ricker. Right. Willa Mae. So she... Um, she was one of the Savoy dancers and she did travel. In fact, I think I remember her being on the tour to Africa. The traditional jazz dance company, I believe she was on that tour, spent three months doing jazz in Africa in 1968, sponsored by the United States Information Service, the department that sent cultural groups around the globe mm -hmm. So people could witness the creativity and the artistry and the individuality of Americans. And they were sponsored that year and went to Africa. Um, and she was in that tour. So um, 
this particular picture, I don't remember. And I can't see who her partner is right there. Did you find this? Um, um, I found this online and I, cause there were many pictures with her with other dancers. I wanted to find something that just cut in on her. So this, this was the one I found of her. Right. Really beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So Maura Den, you know, an amazing person did amazing things when no one else was doing this coming from outside of the American culture, providing this documentation that we can use today but she is just not known. Um, she's not written in a lot of the jazz dance history books, but yet there is all this information here. So um, why, why is she important to jazz dancers today? Why should, you know, why should everybody be reading her work or finding out more about her? Like what is the value to today's jazz dancers? Not just a historical viewpoint. I think it would be really interesting for people to read her work and hear how she talked about racism in the United States and um, the position of the Negro artist and how there was a lack of understanding that in this jazz dance form, this was really a political statement. It was really social mm -hmm. commentary that was going on all the time and being created um, in the moment to particular um, anything that ha was happening. Um, for instance, the Lindy Hop, right? Lindy <laughs> jumped over the Atlantic and then everybody was doing mm -hmm. the Lindy Hop. But everything uh -huh. that was in society was coming out with, in movement inside of these bodies. And the way that she writes about that, the, the contribution of the many, many artists that danced on a daily basis for hours is incredibly extraordinary. The other thing mm -hmm. is her collection, it needs to be seen. The other films, her films of James Berry are exquisite. People should read her poetry as she got uh, later on in life. The rhythm that she always talked about came out in this exquisite poetry and language that she was using. Um, just the documentation that she did, the gestalt of all that for trying to start an academy for and actually running an academy for a few years for mm -hmm. promoting, supporting, and directing the traditional jazz dance company over two decades. Um, mm -hmm. And then always just being at the front of that everything she saw, every change in the development of the music and the dance she was trying to keep up on and writing about. So her work is exquisite. I mean, chron chronology wise, she was before the other great writers, Emery and Stearns and um, Hazard Gordon. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we get a incredible glimpse of this earlier society that we just don't have. Um, that kind of description of by really engaging mm -hmm. in the work. Um, yeah, I think her, it's incredibly valuable and people should look mm -hmm. at it, look at it more definitely. Wow. It's definitely, it's, it's an amazing story. And I would even think looking at this, I mean, easily a regular document documentary, maybe a theatricalized story of her life, or even a Broadway show could be made about this in terms of what this you know person did, this one woman who came and how she fought adversity and, and did these wonderful things for a uh, you know, marginalized group of people. So there's a lot there to talk about what, who she was and um, hopefully she'll get her due at some point. Is there anything else you know, in, in all these facts that you have about Maura Dent? Is there some last little thing you wanna leave? Maybe something we didn't talk about or some other very interesting thing? What do you think? Or did we um, cover everything? You know, this morning, Bob, when I was uh, reading the New York Times and John Lewis's words were there that we all need to be part of this. We, you know, when, when we see something, mm -hmm. we have to speak up. I feel like when I was looking back through these notes and the things that she had written, 
It was the same 50 years ago, right? What we're experiencing right now with Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and the degradation of a whole ethnic group of people. Um, and it has persisted over all these years. And so to understand today, if you look back at her work from 50 years ago and realize she had been saying this for 50 years, that we begin to understand the frustration that is involved mm -hmm. in BLM today and what is happening mm -hmm. now. The level of that frustration, how could, it, how could this be going on for so long? Mm -hmm. It, revisiting her work over the past couple of days in preparation for this has really made me understand why we're at this boiling point and um, the just incredible nerves that we're hitting are mm -hmm. so deep and they've been there for a long time. She recognized that and she was speaking to that, uh, it, you know, in 1936. She was mm -hmm. asking people, please give this value. This is incredible mm -hmm. art. The way these bodies are moving is unlike anything we've ever seen before. So mm -hmm. I hope you pay attention to it now. <laughs> okay, well, that's, 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 that's wonderful information. And hopefully people are gonna pick up on this um, for the future. Now, you obviously, you know, you've written your dissertation on Moradin and have a tremendous amount of information there, which I have from many years ago. So <laughs> I don't know if we can read this a little bit, but but there it is, right? Moved by the Spirit, illuminating the voice of Moradin in her efforts to promote and document jazz dance. Is there anywhere if people are interested that they can get this your dissertation? Is Absolutely. this available at all? Uh -huh. Where can they get it? Yeah, there's a copy in the New York Public Library, and I believe it's okay. digitized now. It should be in Deldry, which is the research section of NDEO, um, mm -hmm. and it should be in the Library of Congress, so it should be available in places to get mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm sure you could probably even make it available as a, a publication on Amazon or something like that, right? You could put this out there and get it to where people have like readily ready access to it. Something else to do on your summer vacation, right? Maybe I'll look into that. <laughs> well, that's what I did with all my writings. I put it all together into one book and put it out on Amazon and just get it out there. Otherwise people don't have to venture into a library and go try to, to search it out and make it as visible as possible. So, right. okay. Kim, thank you so much. This has been wonderful information. And I know people are very interested because I'm looking at the numbers we're watching right now and it's only gone up and up and up and up during the, the, the broadcast. So obviously people are interested and they're sticking with it and want to know much more about this information. So thank you today for stopping in and, and, and giving us everything you know about Meridian. Thank you so much, Bob. Okay. If you don't just hang in there for a second, I'm going to take you out and then I'll end the broadcast and then we'll, we'll say a few words together. Okay. 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 All right. Wow. That was amazing. That was great information. Um, Dr. Kim Chandler Beccaro, she's with Ryder University, and um, she's talking about her research into the work of Mura Den, who was one of the, the fledgling early jazz dance historians um, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, all the way up uh, many years, uh, decades after that also. So lots of good information there, and I hope people take the time to learn more about her. So, and again, all right, this is, uh, I'm Bob Boros. This is my jazz and cat dance life. It's my YouTube channel. Uh, Jazz Nights channel. If you like this work, I would hope that you would click subscribe. I would hope that you would click the notifications bell so that you'll always know when we're doing a new video. And if you click like, that tells YouTube that this is good information and they're more likely to recommend it to somebody else who may be interested in jazz dance. So if you like this, please do all of those three things and we're done. Okay. Thank you so much for watching and sticking with us. And um, we'll see you in the next uh, video coming up very soon. Okay.